All right, welcome back. Shh. Shh. Welcome back. I hope everyone stayed dry on uh, Thursday. How many of you came all the way here to have classes canceled immediately? Yeah, I know. I got the email like at 1213. Is that about right? So I was ready for class. I was ready to go. I was about to come downstairs. I was like actually walking out of my office when I got the email. So I am not happy with what happened. Uh, we were all stuck here for a long time. You went right back home. You turned around, but oh, never mind. Um, all right, so here's my plan. Today we're going to do class eight, uh, which is the uh, uh, stuff on uh, chain of title. So in other words, what was supposed to be for Thursday is today. Um, do you have a class immediately before this one? Yes. OK. Do you have a class after this one? Yes. OK. Um, let's see. Do you have a class? So you have a class. What time does a class for this one start? 1040. OK. So 1040 to this and then right after this. Um, do you have a class after that one? OK. So I, I only want to see classes, not like other conflicts. When does, when does your last class finish after this one? 3.30. OK. Who here is free at 5.10? Who, who here is class at 5.10? OK, that's like two people. OK. Uh, I can either do that or a weekend. Yeah. So it, it, it's not ideal. So the, the question is this. Do I keep you here till 6.30 or make you come in on a Sunday? OK, poll. Good question. All right. So let, let, let's poll you. Let's actually use this thing for what it's supposed to. All right. All right, so here are your choices. Shh, we'll be democratic. We'll be democratic. OK, so Thursday at, at 5.30. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, in general. Uh, well, actually, you know what? What about Wednesdays? Is Wednesdays better? Wednesday at 5. See, the, the problem is, let me just, you all have different schedules. It's impossible. So I'm shooting for like 70% happiness. And the rest of you can watch the video to make up. Ah. OK, so let's. Let me, let me give you three options, OK? And we'll do a poll, OK? I'll be as fair as I can. OK, so yeah. Would it be possible to do a live stream with us? Mm, I want a lot of people here. Okay. I mean, if you want to watch from home, you can. But if you can come, you should. OK, uh, okay so, yeah. You can watch it later. I'll excuse it if you can if you watch the video. If you, have a, if you have a class conflict, something is important, right? Well, I'll be as flexible as I can. All right, so I can do Wednesday. Um, oh, the Jewish holidays are next week. Even okay. Uh, yeah, there's 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 no good day. Okay, so Wednesday, uh, 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 September twenty five, at what five five fifteen? What what in general? What, what time does class finish on Wednesday? 3.30. 3.30? Ah. So like 4? Starting at 4? Starting at, starting at from 4 to 5.30? Yeah. OK. How many of you does that work for? Wednesday, tomorrow at 4, at, at, at four o'clock? Oh, that's, that's going to be it. Sorry. OK. That's enough people. OK. All right. So tomorrow. From 4 o'clock till 5.30, we will do uh, what's class number 9, which is nuisance. 4 o'clock. Um, I'll, I'll get a room. Hopefully, it's this one. It might not be. I don't, I don't know. Uh, OK, so tomorrow from 4 to 5.30, that's class number 9, nuisance, <coughs> which I think you've mostly studied. If you cannot come and you watch the video and email me, I will give you credit. I'll mark you excused. Fair? 
No one will be, if you actually watch, within a week, don't, don't like give you watch me the last week of class. Just give me within a week, watch the video, El Marquee present. Okay? I think th uh, 4 to 5.30 is better than um, uh, 5 to 6.30 uh, in general. Okay. All right. I will, uh, let me make a note to request a room before I forget. Uh, Okay. All right. I will email you a room assignment um, at some point tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what that will be, but we'll be doing the nuisance topic tomorrow. And if you cannot come, uh, you can watch the stream. You can watch it on demand and just email me. I will mark you present. Fair? Okay. It's Rescheduling class for two L's is virtually impossible because you all have different schedules. You have work. It's just, it's not, with one L's, you can actually pull it off because you have more <laughs> or less the same schedules. But legal writing always throws a, a hiccup. We had. Um, I think in, in 2017 with Harvey, I think I just basically waived attendance that semester. It, just, it became impossible. Uh, there were just too many canceled classes to make up. I think I did, I did like three or four weekends to catch up. Um, some professors didn't even make it up. I tried to at least do the weekends, but it's, it, it became very tough. So fortunately, I have one day. Uh, I wish we hadn't even come on Thursday because it took me forever to get home. But uh, I think we'll make do tomorrow. Is that a hand up? Oh, no. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay. All right, so tomorrow from 4 to 5.30. Good? All right. Didn't need a poll for that one. OK. Um, all right. Again, so I apologize that class was canceled. I don't like that they cancel class five minutes before it starts. I think it's very unprofessional. I don't know what the school is thinking. It's not my call. I was ready to teach. I was ready to go. And then, no. OK, so you had, a, you had a basically a huge vacation for me. Uh, I haven't seen you in forever. Feels like it. Um, all right. Uh, let's start with a poll question. I think this will be a little bit rocky because we're rusty. Um, but let's start with this poll question. To start. And I'm going to ask you two different ways. So the first question begins like this O conveys wide acre to A. who does not record, OK? <coughs> o subsequently conveys wide acre to B, who purchases in good faith and for valuable consideration, but does not record. And just to recap, when we say purchase in good faith, what does that mean? It means that he had no knowledge of the prior transaction to A, right? He purchased in good faith. A then records, so A was the first to record, and conveys to C. C purchases in good faith, has no knowledge of the private transaction. Then B records, then C records. I know right now your head's spinning, oh my god, how do I do this, right? These are the sorts of questions your exam will ask you. So the first one, excuse me, asks who prevails under a notice statute, A, B, or C. Notice O is not an option, right? That's not an option, so please don't put D. My questions are about A, B, and C. OK, go ahead. Please put, put your answers in. Another 15 seconds. Who prevails here? Okie doke. We good? All right. Let me pause this here, see where the results are. Ooh, boy. That's pretty evenly split, about 40% of you with B, about 40% with C, another quarter, or 15% with A. All right. 
I don't remember where he was last time. Do you remember? Mackenzie, are you next? Yeah, I think it's next. Wow. Okay, you have a very good memory. Were you just like dreading the last week, like he's going to call me? Yeah, I haven't slept. It's terrible. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. I, 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 I inflict mental trauma on my students. I'm really sorry. I'll, well, let's walk through this one at a time, right, Mackenzie? What makes this complicated is that it's not just about A and B, but it's about A, B, and C. And when you have three different layers, the question gets a lot more difficult, right? So first off, let's start like this, Mackenzie. From O to A, who does not record? At that point, O to A, A does not record. Is there any doubt about A's ownership at that point? No, no, no. All I said was O to A, A does not record. Does A have to record in order to obtain white acre? No. Okay, so that's the first thing for your notes, right? You don't need to actually record to obtain a piece of property. It's not required. Mackenzie, why would someone record? What benefit does that add? It actually ensures their property. Uh, no Against, keep going. Uh, anyone else. Anyone else, right? The reason why you record is not between O and A, right? O and A is fine. That's a clear transaction. The reason why you record is to put other people down the road on notice that you have this property that's yours, right? But just up to here, O conveys to A, there's no problem. So A is fine. The problem arises in the next sentence, right? A, I'm sorry, O conveys to B for consideration and good faith. Now, we say that B is a good faith purchaser, bona fide, right? Doesn't have any knowledge of the prior transaction. Matt, does B record? B does not record. B does not record. Okay, so we have a problem here, right? Matt, you're B, right? And you are a diligent buyer. And you do a title search of White Acre. If you do a title search of White Acre at this point, what would it reveal? Yes. If you did a title search over here, the second sentence, let me, right? Let me just space these out. Might make it a little bit easier to, to, to keep track of, right? If you did a title search at the second sentence, you would never find out about the A transaction. Why? Because A didn't record. A's failure to record was significant. Because A failed to record, B was not on notice that there was any transaction. That's why he's a good faith buyer. He just had no idea, right? There was no notice. Okay, so Ethan, let me ask you a question. Pretend C never comes to this picture, right? Pretend there is no C. It's just A and B. Who wins this case? If it's just A and B, there's no C. In a conflict between A and B, who wins? You're in a notice jurisdiction. Very good. B prevails over A. Okay, why does B prevail over A? Because B was a subsequent bona fide purchaser who did not have notice. And under a notice jurisdiction, B has a strong claim. Yes? Exactly. By A's failing to record, he can then claim the protection of the recording statute, right? A cannot claim the protection of the recording statute because he did not record. Had A recorded first, this would be a very different case. Because, uh, Stephen, if A recorded, would B be bona fide? No. Exactly. Had A recorded, then B would not be a good faith purchaser because there's a record that <laughs> someone else had White Acre. Make sense? Okay. So we know that B prevails over A because B was bona fide, right? No knowledge. All right, Morgan, then we get to the next sentence though, right? A records and conveys to C. Now, Morgan, at this point, does A have any knowledge that B, um, that, that B might also be in the picture? No. Okay. There's no way that A would know about B. Morgan, more question for you. Does C have any knowledge about B? No. Very good. At this juncture, C purchases in good faith. Why? Because B never recorded. C has no way of knowing that B is in the picture. 
All C knows about is A. Now, uh, hold on. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, sorry, Ashley. Ashley, why might C should maybe maybe C should be a little bit nervous here, right? Why might C be a little bit cautious about this transaction? Without C recording. Yeah, but w why so might? Well, if you're C, right, and you do a title search, what might raise some flags? You're buying it from A. Why might you be a little bit nervous about buying Black Acre or White Acre from A? Because A didn't record it. Ah, where did A get it from? Well, how do you know that? No. You don't, right? So if you're C, you're taking a gamble, right? C has no way of knowing how A got it because there's no recording. Now maybe A said, hey, I bought it from, oh, oh, okay. Do you believe them? No, you don't trust a damn thing anyone says in this class. Everyone's a crook, right? Every, every, everyone, everyone's lying to you, right? Everyone's lying. O has no record to A. There's no connection to that. Everyone understand that point, right? But C is still bona fide because there's no indication that C is not the owner. In other words, C was maybe a little lazy, maybe a little risky. But there's nothing telling C, hey, A is a bad guy. There's nothing telling C that A is a bad guy. So now we see in the next sentence, C purchased in good faith, but doesn't record right away. So Bina, let me ask you a question, please. C buys it, and the next day B records. Is C under any obligation to go check the records after he buys it? Why not? Yeah, very good. Exactly, right? We don't expect people to go to the records office every single freaking day and check to see if someone else came along and re recorded something, right? So because C purchased it first, and then B records the next day, is C still bona fide? Yes. Okay, C still bona fide purchaser, good faith. Okay, then finally C records. And at that point, the conflict arises because both B and C now are laying claim to the same piece of property. They both laying claim to Black Acre. Okay? So Elizabeth, now let me ask the question again. This is our poll question, right? How do I even do this thing? I don't know how, to, okay, the results are gone, whatever. Um, oh, here we go, there they are. So we have this question, right? Who prevails between B and C, right? <coughs> or between A, B, and C? What do you think the answer is here? Okay, tell me why you think the answer is C. Well, let's, let's, let's do process of elimination, Elizabeth. What about A? Does A have any? Why does A not have any game? Well, who is A? What did A do here? Yeah, so, so does A have any, any, any skin in this game? Okay, so A's out, that's wrong. So between B and C. So in a notice jurisdiction, Elizabeth, who prevails, B or C? Well, remind us, Elizabeth, removed from last week, who wins in a notice jurisdiction? What do you have to have? Just, just check your notes if you want to take a minute to look back. Say that one more time, a little bit more slowly, please. Okay, good. So in a notice jurisdiction, if a subsequent buyer has notice of a prior unrecorded deed, she won't prevail. Let me state it in the positive. In a notice jurisdiction, a bona fide purchaser prevails if she lacks notice, right? So Elizabeth, one more question. Did C have notice about B's transaction when she bought it? No. Is, she, is C a bona fide purchaser? Yes. So who prevails? Okay, that's correct. The answer here is C, okay? Okay, but let me, let, me, let me explain why. B is bona fide and C is bona fide, right? That's why it gives, gives students a little bit of a, of a trick, right? Both B and C are bona fide. They both are, they're both in good faith. However, you find who's the most recent. In a notice jurisdiction, the most recent bona fide, the lowest person on the chain, right, is the winner. You look whoever's most recent bona fide purchaser. Because C is most recent, bona fide, C prevails. Sucks for B, B did absolutely nothing wrong. 
right? Well, maybe he did one thing wrong. What, what did B not do? He did not record quickly enough. Had B recorded the same day he bought Blackacre or Whiteacre, this would be a different case. Because had B recorded, then C would not be bona fide. See that? The only way C prevails if she's bona fide, and because B failed to record, that makes her good faith. So basically, sucks to B, right? By B failing to record, one second. By B failing to record in a notice jurisdiction, B loses. Now, can B sue O for fraud? Yes, he can. That, that, that remedy is always available. That's not what I'm asking about. But my question is in a quiet title action, who has a strong claim to Blackacre or Whiteacre? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's my question, I think, for um, uh, uh, Ashley a few minutes ago, right? When A bought Whiteacre from O, there was no recording. Then when C came along, C should have been nervous. Like, wait a minute. What's going on? Maybe I should dig into this, right? But let's just say that C had investigated. Would there be any record of the B deed? So there's, even if there's inquiry notice, there's nothing to find because there's no recording to B. Because there's no recording to B, there's, there's, there's nothing to find, and there's no fault for C. C is completely in good faith. I saw a hand somewhere here. Yeah. So if, if hypothetically they were to, to record on the same day, is it date? Is it oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, this is a, th we, we, we had a case, like the, I, think, I think, like this last week, where the, the deed was not recorded until a few hours later. Um, unfortunately, there's not a good answer here. It, it, it's If one was recorded, like, at you know noon, and next recording at two p.m. and you do the search at one, that's too bad, right? It, it's in sequential order in which they're recorded. Even if it's not even possible to go through all those books in an hour, they have to do it by the time it was docketed, which is not a very good answer. The better answer is what happens if uh, I bring in my deed at nine a.m., you bring your deed at, at five p.m. and they get to yours first because it's in the pile, and even though I brought mine in first, yours is actually recorded with an earlier timestamp, right? What matters is when the clerk enters it, not when you brought it to the office. So there might be even cases where you get screwed, even if you're more diligent. Um, generally, it takes a long time to buy property. It doesn't happen like within a span of hours. But you have cases where these things happen in, in, in fast succession. Make sense? All right, so everyone understand the first part. I'm going to ask you the same question now with the race notice statute. All right, so same question. Another poll question, please. You're now in a race notice <coughs> jurisdiction. Okay, the exact same facts, but you have a race notice. You're, you're, California, for example, is race notice. Texas is notice. California, for example, is race notice. Same question, same facts, same everything else. Okay, another 10 seconds or so. All right, let me stop it there. Let's see what the numbers look like. Okay, a lot of you, a lot of you uh, went now for B. Okay, a lot of you went for B. So let's walk through this one step at a time. Um, who's that? Is that Kayla? You're next, Kayla. Uh, Kayla, can you remind me <coughs> what is a race notice jurisdiction? What's like the 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 the, the, the way it works in those jurisdictions? Okay, say, say it one more time. I think you're right, but I want to make sure everyone heard you. Who, preva let me, who prevails in a race notice jurisdiction? Let me ask you the question. No, that's race. Race notice. Who, you, you said it correct the first time. I'm just reframing your answer. Who prevails? I see Elizabeth, you're whispering. Who prevails in a race notice jurisdiction? End. There are two factors, right? What do, you, what do you have to do to prevail? There are two requirements. You said it. Very good. So with a notice jurisdiction, you need only one thing, to be subsequent bona fide. It doesn't matter if you record first. The race notice is a little bit more complicated, right? Why is it more complicated? 
you need to not only be bona fide, you have a second requirement. You have to be bona fide and you have to record first. If you're bona fide and you don't record first, you lose. So you have to have both of them, right? Everyone understand what I'm talking about, right? It's not enough to just one, you gotta have both of them. All right, so Elizabeth, let's talk through this one step at a time, right? <coughs> one step at a time. We have a conflict now between A, B, and C. O conveyed to A, A didn't record. O conveyed to B, B purchased in good faith and did not record. Who prevails, Elizabeth, between A and B? Okay, why? Did A record yet? Did either of them record? Okay, so let me ask you again, Elizabeth. You have a conflict between A and B. B was subsequent bona fide, no question about it. But B failed to record. Who wins here between A and B? Again, uh, Kayla said a minute ago, that's why I was drilling her so hard on that, right? What are the two things you have to have to prevail with a race in those jurisdiction? And? Did B record? So who prevails here between A and B? A. Let me, let me do it one more time. A prevails over B, because who records first? A. So you gotta go two, two lines down. Ah. A prevails over B, because A was the first to record. Even though A recorded a couple, you know, time, whatever months later, A prevails over B. This is why race notes gives students a, a, a difficulty every, every semester without fail. You need two things to prevail. You gotta be subsequent bona fide and you have to record first. Here, because A was the first to record before B, B cannot rely on the statute. B lost out, B was lazy. B didn't record on time, B cannot prevail. Okay, so now here come, here's the things that are even more messy. Dakota. We say that A became the, the correct owner at this point, right? When he recorded first, right? A then conveys to C. Is C uh, bona fide? Did C record first? Yes, tell me why it doesn't matter, you're right. Perfect. See, you're, you're exactly right. Here's what everyone says. Ah, look, B recorded first and C. That doesn't matter for race notice. Why? Because at this point, right over here, this sentence, at this point, A owned it. And then A conveyed it to C. B was screwed. Because B failed to record first, B cannot win. The answer has to be C because only A can convey title to C, right? A prevails over B, and because A wins, A conveyed it to C, and A gave C good title. So the answer here, if I can go back to my results, is this one, it's C. So the answer is C in both of them, but for very different reasons, right? Again, let me, let me, let me walk through this, about a third of you got, a quarter of you got this right only. Um, when A recorded first, A knocked out B. B no longer could satisfy the recording statute. You need to have both bona fide and subsequent recording. First record. He was only subsequent bona fide, it was not first record. B's gone. And because A was now the right owner, the strongest claim, A conveyed to C, it doesn't matter that C recorded later. B was out of the picture, B got knocked out. So the way these recording statutes work, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you can't claim protection. B can no longer claim protection under the race notice statute because he failed to record. B is like, I'm out. I, I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I'm out. Therefore, the only one with the claim left is C. Tricky question, right? This is in your book, actually. I took it right from your, from your case book. It's on page uh, 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 685. I didn't make it up, it's a good question. But if you didn't understand this, go back to 685 in your notes, in your case book, and just walk through it one more time. Um, this is precisely the kind of question I'll put in an exam. 
but it won't be with three people, it'll be like five people, right? It'll be A, B, C, D, and E, right? And you have to keep track, okay, A prevails over B, but C over B, and you have to sort of keep these in your head. But this is like a very good starting point. It took almost, what, 30 minutes to walk through, but I think it's a good question. That's why when you see the number of pages for reading, you can never estimate of how long it actually will take. I, I have a sense, but you never know. Oh, only 15 pages. But this, this one question took half an hour, or maybe 20 minutes after the thing. OK. Everyone understand this one. So the answer is C for both of them, but for very, very different reasons. OK. All right, anything in that one? All right, let's do another question. Sir, oh, yeah, go ahead, Tyler. What's the fundamental difference between that one and example seven? Is that what I'm about to do next? Yeah. Right. You read my mind. Let's do example number seven. I swear, it was, it was, I have a queued up here. It wasn't, was, not a, uh, it was, was not a planted question. Well, they, they do exist. Okay, go to 692, please. I'm sorry, uh, 692. Um, and you have these, uh, here we go, example seven, which I, I, it was actually next to my notes, so it totally read my mind, I think. All right, this question illustrates what's called chain of title. Um, Alexis, what does chain of title mean? It is, it refers to the sequence of Okay, that's one meaning. So, so Alexis is correct. Uh, one meaning of chain of title is a sequence of transactions from the beginning to the present, right? From O to A, from A to B, from B to C, right? It's, it's this sort of chain. Um, but the phrase chain of title is a second meaning that often gives students more difficulty. Uh, chain of title also refers to the period of time for which records must be searched. The period of time for which records must be searched. In other words, here are the things that you should examine if you want to be a bona fide purchaser, right? If you want to claim bona fide protection, you have to search the following things, right? Um, if there's something in there that you didn't find, guess what? You're not bona fide, right? So these are things you should be on notice, constructive notice, you might say, that you should find. Uh, if there's some document that's you know completely outside the scope of your chain of title, you're not expected to find it. Why, you know, so for example, let's say that someone randomly changed your name and didn't tell anyone. There's no record of it, so none of the none of the records match up. You're probably not expected to find someone with this person's name where there's no record of a name change. Now, if let's say the person got married and they changed their maiden name to a married name, there's a record of that. You can then determine if there are any properties listed under the married name or the maiden name, right? So depending on how reasonable it is, you have a document either inside or outside the chain of title. OK. Everyone with me? All right, so let's do example number seven. Um, it's on page uh, 692. OK. Uh, but, but who's next? Uh, Courtney. All right, you want to read example number seven for me, please? O conveys to A, B does not report. <coughs> OK, thank you so much. All right, let's walk through this one step at a time, right? It's a little bit tricky. I think Tyler was saying, what's the difference between this one and that one? So there, there's some similarities. Let's just walk through them, OK? So it begins, O conveys to A who does not record. Welcome to our world, right? Every question is the exact same way. O to A who does not record. Why does it always begin this way? If A records, it's an easy question. Because once A records, everyone else is put on notice of the transaction. So for these questions to work, A can never record. Poor A, right? A never does what he's supposed to do. OK, now a little bit different. A conveys to B who records the A to B deed. Now, Courtney, if you're B, what might you be worried about at this point, right? A is offering to sell you Blackacre. And you're like, maybe I should buy it, maybe I shouldn't. What, what might you, your B, what might you be worried about this right now? Yeah, how, how can you can you check where A got it from? Not if A cannot record. 
correct. A did not record the deed from O. So really, if you're B, you're, li you're living on a prayer, right? You are, you are hoping that this is honest, but maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to know, maybe, ah, you know, I don't know, right? But something's up. Okay, the next sentence uh, for Josh. Josh says, O conveys to C a purchaser for value who has no knowledge of the deeds from O to A and A to B. So Josh, is there any way at this point for C to know about any of these prior transactions? So yeah, since uh, B recorded it, he should see the transaction from A to B. But how would? Oh yeah, because there's no A to A, so then he can't see it. OK, so, want to raise your hand? Yeah. <coughs> Well, that doesn't exist in most jurisdictions. I want you to assume that you have the grant or grantee index, not a tract index, right? But Josh is right. If you are C, you don't know about A or B. All you know about is O. Let me say it again. If you're C, the only name you know is O. You don't know A or B. You can't be expected to know about A and B because there's no link from O to A and from A to B. What we would say then is that the A to B deed is not within the chain of title, right? We would say that the A to B deed is not in the chain of title for C, right? Whatever C's obligation is to do reasonable research, the A to B deed is not in that, in that link. There's no way for him to know. How, how would he know who B is? He has no idea. Now, I think Jack raises a fair point. If, if you had an index where you listed the property names, like Blackacre and Whiteacre, yeah, then you could search for everything listed by Blackacre. But in this class and in most jurisdictions, you have to presume that things are listed by names, grant or grantee, not by Blackacre or Whiteacre. That would be too easy, wouldn't it, right? You just search, oh, yeah, look for, just search Control F for Blackacre. No, no, it doesn't work like that. All right, so C here, the reason why is good faith is because there's no way of him knowing about the A to B deed. Okay, at that point then C records. So you have the A to B deed recorded, and you also have the O to C deed recorded. So my question here, uh, oh sorry, yes, go ahead. Okay, so C wouldn't have notice because there's a gap. Anyway. Yes, there's n nothing linking O to A and A to B. There's, there's, no, there's a, the missing link, if you will, right? You don't have, a, you don't have that link in the chain. from. The only name, and this is how I encourage you to do the question, right? O is purchased from C, right? O is buying it from C. Hannah, what's the only name that C knows? The only person he knows to look for? O, right? Would he ever know to search for A? Would he ever know to search for B? That's a concept of chain of title. Chain of title means what are the names which you should reasonably expect it to search for? And there's no reasonable duty to search for A or B. They just don't know the names. It's not part of their a chain of title that they would search for. The only name they know is O. They can find, where did O get it from? X. X got it from Y, right? But they don't know o, A and B. Uh, so Javier, let me ask you this question, sir. Um, we have who prevails, B or C? OK, tell me why. Because, oh, the A and B deed is outside the chain of title. Very good. Exactly. Javier's correct. C prevails here, right? C wins. Why? The A to B deed is outside the chain of title. It does not give constructive notice, right? The A to B deed does not give constructive notice. It's not enough to put on notice C, a subsequent bona fide purchaser. Okay? Yeah, Dakota. No, 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 that's Jacqueline's question a minute ago. We don't do that. You can't search by property address and lot number. That doesn't exist. All you have is grant or grantee. Right, in theory, I think Jacqueline and Dakota have raised fair points. If you could just search for Blackacre, it just take two seconds, right? But we don't have that. That's not a, that's not a thing that, that, that we have in most jurisdictions. So we answer here that the answer is C. And the reason why the answer is C is because the A to B deed is not properly recorded to give constructive notice to the world, it's insufficient because there's a gap. There's a gap between O and A. 
And because that missing link is there, it's insufficient. So here, I think Tyler, does that clarify the difference between this question and what we did a minute ago? Yes, sir. So because they recorded in the, in the first example, yeah. they were recording the O to A. So when B recorded, uh, yeah. even though they had no knowledge, there should have been constructive notice at that point. Yeah, yeah Tyler, let me, let, me, let me mix this question up, right? Let's say that A recorded the A to B deed right away. Would C still be bona fide? Had A recorded his deed, why not? He would have knowledge. Right, let's just walk through this one step at a time. Let's say that A recorded. At that point, there's a D from O to A and a D from A to B. That chain's complete. If you're C, you know that O's a fraudster, right? You know that there's someone else in the chain. And then you'd have noticed that A and B, C would not prevail. The only way that C is bona fide is because A failed to record. Again, this is A's failure. Even if B recorded, it's irrelevant. You need the link from O to A. That's the missing link you need. Okay, questions? Questions? Oh, yes, sir, uh, Ernest. So, so the proper termination terms would be because A recorded, we now have notice. Or, or we now have what? We now have notice. Yes, had A recorded, there would be a, a record notice for um, uh, C. That's correct. And therefore, C would not be bona fide. C so can't be bona fide if A records. Again, when you do these things for the exam, pay very close attention to the sequencing. Who buys it first? Who is it recording? Maybe they record this deed, but not that deed, right? And depending on the dates on which they record it can make a question to a completely different. Yet, yet, if this didn't click, go back after class and redo example seven, do the one in 685, just redo it in your head and make sure it doesn't. If you want, come talk to me later. Because you need to, I ask this almost every year without fail. There's a, there's a, there's a chain of title question almost every semester because it's a very easy thing to test on. Either get it or you don't. It, it, this is not like a gray area where it's sort of like wishy washy. This, this, there's an answer. It's either B or C. It's not like, oh, it depends. I, like, I can test you on this one very, very easily. I tell my con law students I actually like teaching property more because in property there's a right answer. The answer here is C. Right? <laughs> there's no, it's not like, oh, what does Justice Kennedy think? The, the answer is C. Uh, uh, I can give you good answers here. Okay. All right. Any other questions on, on these two questions? Which took almost 40 minutes to do. Okay. Let's move on to then the, uh, the, the cases for, for today. Uh, a brief note uh, on who's protected by recording statutes. Okay. Uh, generally, people who purchase for value, right? Why does it always say they purchase for value? Uh, because if it's a gift, you may not be protected, depending on the state. Um, if you don't purchase for value, you're not protected. That's a small note. Um, not, not very important. OK. All right, let's do the first case. Um, Lewis versus Superior Court of California. Um, and of course, this is a case from California. What's going to happen? What's going to happen, California? They're going to reverse the common law. Yes, that's what they do. You don't have to read the case. You, just, you know what's going to happen. Uh, it, it's almost without fail. All right, uh, I think it's that Lauren, are you next? Yes. Lauren, you want to uh, give me the facts, please, in um, uh, Lewis? The facts are a little bit messy. I'll, I'll help you along, but just, just let's start off with the facts. Okay, so let's just get our date straight. In February of 92, Lewis contracted to buy it, right? from Shipley for $2 million. Why is it important that I said they contracted to buy it? That's actually an important fact. Okay. You don't buy property immediately. It's a process, right? Remember we talked about closing process, right? It sometimes takes up to a month to actually acquire a piece of property. It's not like, okay, I go to you know a store and buy a widget and I have the widget in my pocket, right? Property takes a while to do. And the reason why this process matters here is that during that month or so that it took to actually finish the transaction, stuff happened, right? So in other words, it's called an executory contract where we sign it today, but at some point in the future, it closes, 
All right, so, so Lauren, so in February of 92, they contracted by the house for $2 million. Okay, what happens next, Lauren? Okay, very good. Um, on February 23rd, Fontana records a list pendants. A list pendants against Shipley. Um, is that Jasmine? What's a list pendants? It's a funny word. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jasmine. A list pendants is a notice. You're saying, look, I filed a lawsuit in court. It's li being litigated now. Maybe I'll win. Maybe I'll lose. But if I win, this property may be used to satisfy the judgment, right? That in other words, if I win this lawsuit and there are damages, I can actually seize Blackacre and use it to pay off my, 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 my damages, right? Um, the reason why you follow this lawsuit is to put the world on notice that this property may come into collection at some point, right? That the lawsuit goes your way. Uh, you're, you're designing this to try to put people on notice. Now, Jasmine, when did Fontana bring the list pendants to the records office? What was the date? Oh, no, no, oh, what, the date, it was actually, he, he recorded it. The dates here actually matter. I'm usually not a stickler for the dates, but they, they do matter in this case. Uh, I have 23rd, but maybe I'm 24th? OK, I'm sorry. OK, but yes, thank you. Fontana recorded on the 24th, but there was a problem. Jasmine, when was it actually indexed? It was indexed on the 19th. Okay, very good. That's why we have a problem. I think Stephen's not here, uh, but, but he asked this question to me before, right? What happens if you bring a paper to a court on day one and they don't get around to recording until five days later? Sucks for you. Right? And here it actually makes a difference because during that five days, stuff happened. Okay, so he brings it there on the 24th. Uh, I'm sorry, I had the 23rd, I know it's the 24th. On the 29th, it's record, I'm sorry, it's indexed. When I say indexed, they actually put it into the book, right? Either electronic or paper, whatever it is, they actually put it. If a person went to the records office on the 25th through 6th through 7th through 8th, they couldn't find it, it didn't exist. They were indexing on the 29th, whatever that process is in the jurisdiction. Okay. On the 25th, Lewis pays $350,000 in the contract. The recording then is on the 28th, right? They close and the deeds record on the 28th. And then Shipley gave a note for another 1.9 million. Again, on the 29th, it was indexed leap year, right? February 29th, go figure, right? So we have a problem. Lewis recorded the deed on the 28th. And the list pendants was indexed on the 29th. Right? Uh, that's uh, Katie. So on the 28th, was there any notice about this lawsuit? No, there's no notice. Even though it was re recorded, right? Because it wasn't indexed. Was um, Louis bona fide at that purchase, at that point? Yes. Yes. Did he have any notice of how this lawsuit might be pending? OK, Katie's right. On the 28th, Louis was bona fide, right? Completely bona fide, no notice whatsoever. OK, but Katie, they didn't buy the transaction outright. Instead, they put down a note, which is basically like a loan. Katie, at what point did they finish paying off the note? No, I'm sorry. A little, little bit earlier. Uh, March so basically next month. So here's the issue, right? When they closed and recorded the deed, Lewis was bona fide. However, Katie, finish it up. When the payment was made, the last payment was made in March of 92, was there notice of this, of this lawsuit indexed? No. Um, what was recorded? What, what was the indexing date? What, 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 what date? The 
29th, 29th, close enough, yeah, we're, we're fine, leap year, right? So here's the issue, right? When the deal was closed, when the transaction closed, there was no notice. But when the loan was finally paid off, the 1.9 million, there was notice. Right, so here's the issue. Tanya, was Louis bona fide when he finished paying off the note? Well, let me ask the question, under the common law, under the common law in California, before the modern court got to it, would Lewis have been bona fide? Yes. Tell me why. Uh, isn't that what the Court of Appeals said? I'm asking the common law rule. Uh, no. Well, well, tell me why. What was the old rule in California before the modern court got to it? Say it again. Well, under the, uh, that doesn't matter for this. Notice jurisdiction doesn't matter. Under the common law, when the last payment was made at, for $1.9 million, was, it, was the deed indexed? Was the list pendants indexed? So should Lewis have been on notice? Yes. Now, that's great. Now, Katie, let me ask you a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, 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 it, it was highlighted. I couldn't really oh, read. I, 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 I was making an educated guess based on letters I saw. I'm sorry, Katya. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's, that's tricky, Katie and Katya, right next to each other. Katya, let me ask you a question. Uh, you ever had like a loan where you pay something out every month? Every time you make a payment, do you like check on stuff or you just write a check? I just pay. Do you think Lewis, every time he made a payment on this note, went down to the records office and did a search? No. What do you think he did? didn't really check. So under the old California common law rule, was there a duty to check every single time you make a payment? No. Well. Under the common law rule? Yes. Well, what, what did the old California court hold in the 1800s, the old decision? Old rule. You're giving me a good answer, but you mumbled it at the end. Oh, I just said that. Under the common law, the last payment was made when the state passed. You're right. You're right. Say it again. Under the common law. Good. So then he, he should have known at that point. Yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So we have a situation in California. We have a, we have a rule, a common law rule. A, was it the California Supreme Court, right? The highest court in the land. The California Supreme Court said that a common law, you had notice, right? When you made this last payment, you had notice. Therefore, you cannot claim the benefit of the recording statute, right? You are now subject to this list pendants. If you are subject to the recording statute, you can't be subject to this lawsuit. But because there was notice filed, the 29th, it was filed, recorded, and, and indexed, you are now on notice. Now, generally, Tyler, can, it, can a court of appeals, the intermediary court, reverse the Supreme Court of the state? No. no. But, but what, what do they do here? Preposterous. They can't. How could a lower court reverse the Supreme Court of the state? How could that be? The, uh, <laughs> What did he do? We talked about him applying an outdated law to modern facts. Okay, he drew good. A, a distinguishing feature between the Davis case that wrote the common law and what um, uh, the Lewises were contending with. Yeah. So, but do they overrule that case? They didn't overrule it. No, sir. What what they do? Just 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 they, they said very funny the way they said it. It's, they said very strange. What? Javier said it correct. They're going to limit the Supreme Court decision to the facts of that case. What the hell does that mean, Javier? Like, what, can you do that as a lawyer? Like, Your Honor, I'm going to limit this case to the facts. What, what, you, it's like, it's just, we, don't, we don't want to apply it. We're just going to limit it to those facts. So 
you know, if, if the, uh, what was the guy's name? What was the name of the case? Uh, Davis. Davis. So if the defendant's name is Davis, the case applies. For anyone else but Davis, we don't apply it. Is that, is that based what they did? Yeah, I, th I think I think Javier said it said it correctly. They basically said we're going to limit the case to the facts, and this is something that courts do eh, every now and then. Um, this is what happens when they don't want to overrule a decision, or they can't overrule a decision. So instead, they take a, a step short of it. They said um, we're going to just limit it to its facts. So basically, we won't apply it ever again. We won't overrule it, but it has no more relevance. So any case where the facts are even slightly different. It doesn't apply. Now, this is not what you learned. Right? Didn't you learn from your first year of law school? You take a precedent, you compare it to the facts here. Is it similar? Are there distinctions? Right? You sort of do this case process. You're saying, well, because the facts are different, we're going to ignore this ruling. That's not what judges do. That's California's. What the hell? Right? <laughs> only slightly exaggerating. Um, only slightly. But I prefer when they just say we're overruling the doctrine, at least be straightforward. Here, it's like, well, we're just going to ignore it. Um, it's an old rule. Doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't like it. So we understand what the court did. So as a result, Alun, what does the court hold here then? What, what's what's the actual holding then in um, uh, Lewis? Yeah, very good. The court holds that Lewis is bona fide. He did not have notice, even though it was recorded because there's no obligation to check every single time you write a check. And therefore, he was bona fide. And because he was bona fide, he can rely on the recording statute. And again, who recorded here first? He did, right? He recorded the day before the list pendants was indexed. Right, this is race notice. We're in California, my friends, right? Right? Because there's a race notice jurisdiction in California, Lewis recorded the day before Fontana. So therefore, they deem him to be bona fide. He recorded first. He does not have to deal with this lawsuit. So if Fontana recorded the lawsuit one day earlier, the 27th, this lawsuit went the other way. But because, excuse me, but because the office sat around for five or six days, this is Stephen's question. Fontana lost the lawsuit. He got burned because he waited too long. The office didn't do it right away. Now, is this Fontana's fault? Probably not. I mean, I, I think he probably reasonably tried to get it recorded quickly. He moved as quickly as he could. But the office didn't do it, and then he lost. And also, the California courts reversed the common law. Right Under the common law, Fontana would have prevailed easily, but not here. All right, so bottom line, Fontana lost, Lewis prevailed because the court got rid of this rule that makes you check every time you write a payment or make a payment. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, is, is, oh, God, I can't read that. Uh, Rob. Rob, oh my God, that's so tiny. Rob, let me ask you a question. Rob, what would have happened if instead of paying for a note, they just paid it out in a mortgage? In other words, um, Fontana, I'm sorry, Lewis gave a down payment, say $10,000, and then went to Bank of America and made monthly payments to Bank of America for 30 years. Would a person making mortgage payments be obligated to check the records? Uh, I think so long as they put the down payment down. I the payment to whom? Uh, to the person for the property. Yes. Right. If this was a mortgage, I think the case is completely different. Right. When you pay for a mortgage, basically all the money goes to the seller at the outset from the bank, and you're just paying off the bank. And there's no there's no duty to keep checking, checking, checking. But here it was unique. The note went to the seller. In other words, the seller said, "All right, pay me, you know, whatever now and two million dollars later." So it was with the seller. That's why this ongoing duty may have existed under the common law. Make sense? Okay. Very good. All right, I think that's good for Lewis. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, next one's a little bit tricky. Um, the facts the next one are a little bit tricky. We'll go through it carefully. Um, the next one turns on different kinds of notice. 
And the book uh, explains that there are three <coughs> types of notice, three types of notice. Um, there is actual notice, record notice, and inquiry notice. The last two are basically the same. Just, just, just get ready for it. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain the little differences. Uh, the first one, actual notice, means that you're personally aware of a conflicting interest. So for example, if I tell you, oh, don't buy that. Oh, also sold black acre to A. Don't buy it. OK, that's actual notice. You actually were told that there's something going on. But most of the time, you don't have actual notice. In almost every case, you have what's called record notice, where there's something in the chain of title. There's some recorded document that you should find that will tell you there's a problem. OK? Right. Record notice is when there's something in the chain of title that you should find that will tell you something's up. OK, what's inquiry notice? Inquiry notice is where the facts are sort of strange. You know, for example, you're buying property from A, and you have no idea how A got the property. Right? There's no, there's no record from O to A. And inquiry notice is like, wait a minute. Um, hey, where'd you get this from? Where'd you get it from? Tell me. <laughs> right? So sometimes you might be in a duty to ask. But look, A might lie. A can make stuff up, and you can still be bona fide. But you might be on a duty to just you know, ask about it. OK, questions on this one? OK, let's do the next case then. Uh, is it Brianna? <laughs> OK, let's do the facts in Harper versus Paradise. And this, again, the facts are a little bit messy. I'll, I'll help you through it. But let's just start off with the facts in Harper. OK, good. And, and just, just, just to recap, when you give someone a life estate, that means I like you, but not that much. Right? Saying, I like you, but when you die, I want someone else to get it. Right? Had Susan loved <laughs> Maud, as we all should love Maud, she would have given her a fee simple. But she didn't. She gave her a life estate. It was like, I like you, but, but not that much. All right, uh, go on, Brianna. So that means she really didn't trust Maud, which is actually good because the woman mortgaged it away for basically nothing, right? But basically saying, look, Maud, I love you, and I love your kids. I don't trust you. You might sell this. You might get rid of it. I want to make sure that whatever crap you do to the land ends when you die. And once you're dead, it will go to your kids. All right, Brianna, go on. Um, and then the, so the deed was lost at a certain point. I yeah, think. vanished. Yes. And then it, wasn't, it wasn't found until 1957. Right? So basically, it was stuck in a, tr in a chest somewhere. Who knows, right? Um, was it recorded, Brianna? Yes. In 1957. Good, yes. It was recorded you know, three decades later. OK, very good. OK. All right, Gabriella, let's, so what happens after that? What's the next step in the, in the facts? Um. After, after the, 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 she died without a will, OK? Price, Prudy, Mildred, and Harper. So there are four legal heirs, right? OK, go on. Did all the heirs do it, or just some of them? No, um, all, but I think it was John. John, yeah. yeah. So three out of the four heirs executed an instrument to Maud. And then what did this instrument say, Gabriella? OK, so let's just stop there for a second, right? You can imagine this is a situation that happens every now and then, right? Poor Maud gets his deed, and it disappears. She wasn't very organized. And her kids say, look, we have the remainder. right? We have the remainder. And we want our beloved Maud to have a fee simple. And you can do that if the remainderman Transfer their future interest to Maud. When you combine the life estate plus the remainder, that makes fee simple, right? 
But Gabriella, are all four of the heirs there? No. So would this be an effective transfer of the remainder? No. Okay, it's not. Um, this deed does not convey the remainder to Maud, because only three out of four of them, right? Maud does not have fee simple after this. Maud only has a life estate after this. Okay, but the reason why this deed is important is not because it conveyed anything to Maud. It was basically ineffective, right? Uh, Jalen, why is this deed important? What about this document is significant for this case? Why, why is it important? What was in this deed that was relevant? Yes. The reason why this deed is important is it references the disappeared deed, right? And Jalen, just finish it up. Why is it important that, that this instrument references the, 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 missing, the missing deed? Why is that fact important? Um, because, it, because of the people that tried to come Yes, exactly, right? This instrument put on notice that there's something up, right? It says, look, there is this other deed floating around. We don't know where it is. We don't really care, but there's this deed floating around. Now, now uh, Rachel, if you were going to buy the farm by Black Acre, right, and you did your homework, and you see this reference, this mysterious deed that vanished 30 years ago, you don't know where the heck it is, would you go ahead and you know maybe like ask about it? Maybe yeah. would you buy Black Acre? Yeah, she's right. The reason why this deed's important is not because it gave the remainder to Maud. It didn't. It couldn't because not all four of them were united. Right? Had all four of them been there, it'd be a different story. But it wasn't. The deed significant because it puts on inquiry notice subsequent buyers. Right? It puts on inquiry notice subsequent buyers that maybe you should inquire what is this deed. Yeah, Rachel. Because you don't, you don't have the actual deed to know what it said, okay. right? The, the concept of inquiry notice, why it's a little bit different, is it means this should make you ask some questions, right? You can't actually see the document because it's vanished, right? So you can't have actual because the document's missing. And you can't have record because this document was never recorded. It was recorded like in the 50s later. But you have inquiry notice saying, wait a minute, what's this deed going on, right? What's this mysterious m missing deed? You know, maybe what they wrote wasn't accurate. Maybe it actually conveyed something else. So it puts you on notice of asking questions. And if you ask these questions, you say, this is not something I want to buy. OK? But they put that fact in there was significant. All right? Get with me. All right, so tell me, let's go ahead with the facts, right? So they write this little instrument, and they say, our beloved Maud, we are giving you our interest. It's all yours, right? What is Maud going to do with the property? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> what, what, does that, what does that mean, she executed a security deed? What, what, what does that mean? You're right, but what, what does that mean? Yeah, she took a loan. She took a loan secured by the property for 50 bucks. Right, and tell me what happens when she didn't pay up? Um, they foreclosed. So beloved Maud, right? No wonder they didn't trust the woman, right? Within like a couple years after they gave her this property for the rest of her life, <laughs> she goes and mortgages it. She mortgages the damn farm, right? Not even what, five years later? She, for she, she defaults on it. Um, three years later, I'm sorry. She defaults on it. Um, she defaults on it. And there's a problem, right? So Melissa. Let's say you have a property in fee simple, right? And you get a loan on it. And it, you don't pay up and the loan defaults. If someone acquires the land, do they get it free and clear at, at the sale? Again, you own a piece of property in fee simple and you default on loan. There's a, there's a sale. Right when you when you get the land at the sale, do you get it now in fee simple? Let me ask a question. That was a bad question. Let me ask it differently. Right, you own a life estate. 
someone decides to give you a loan and then you default on it and then they foreclose the property. What interest do they acquire at the foreclosure sale? Again, you had a life estate. Do they get a fee simple? Why? Why is the answer life estate? That's right. Say it again. No, no, no. I, let's finish it up, right? If you have a life estate and you take out a mortgage and you don't pay up and they foreclose the property, what interest does a bank acquire then? Yes. When you give a loan, you can only acquire at foreclosure the interest the person has. So if Maude had a life estate, the sheriff could only sell a life estate at the auction. If Maude had a fee simple, they get a fee simple. So this case turns on what interest did Maude actually have. If Maude, in fact, had fee simple, then it was foreclosed forever. But if Maude only had a life estate, the foreclosure sale only got a life estate. And then Melissa finished it up. When Ma dies, what happens to the property? The bank foreclosed and they got a life estate. And what happens when Marge, Ma, when Ma, not Marge, Ma dies? What happens in general after a life estate? Who does it go to? It goes to the remainder. Exactly, it's the remainder. The remainder, man, right? The heirs. So if, in fact, Maude only had a life estate, once she died, all those people in the line were screwed. It went down to the remainder, the three of the four, heir, or the four heirs. Is that indicative of why the bank only gave her $50? Or? Well, that's a good question, right? We have a, it wasn't a bank. It was uh, some Thornton, whoever, th you know, Thornton gave a loan for $50. And maybe they gave that knowing that it was only a life estate. Right? Thornton maybe knew it, maybe didn't. I don't know. But they gave her a $50 loan. The loan was for 50 bucks. Now, we don't know what Thornton knew. We, we, we don't know what happened here. But we know that there was a sale. And we know that the, at the sheriff's sale, <coughs> Thornton has it. Right? And at some point, Thornton conveyed it to Lincoln and William Paradise. <coughs> okay? Paradise had it till 1955. <coughs> At some point in 1957, the deed is discovered. And then Maud dies. Now, um, let's see. Uh, Natalia, let me ask you a question. When Paradise bought it, in the 30s from Thornton. <sighs> what might they have found, right? When Paradise, I'm sorry, when, 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 when Paradise bought it in 19, uh, 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 was it 50, uh, 55, or 30, 36, I'm sorry. When Paradise bought it, what should Paradise have been looking for? This is the hard question. Okay, so what, what would be in the chain of title when Paradise searches for it? Well, let's start, right? You're Paradise. Who are you buying it from? No, no. Who, who did Paradise buy it from? Who gave the loan? I'm sorry? Thornton, yes, very good. Right. Natalia, so you are Paradise. You're buying from Thornton, right? So see that Thornton is your grantor. What do you search for next? Um, you down. Okay. And what, do, what are you trying to find out? Um, what do you want to know? You're buying from Thornton. What do you want to know? Well, before you, who is Harper? Where do you get the name Harper from? Hey, John? Uh, the 1928 deed that we're talking about? 
OK, good. So let's walk through this one step at a time, right? Your paradise, John. You're buying it from Thornton. OK. What do you want to know next? So you want to make sure that they have good titles. You want to know where Thornton got it from, right? Okay. So where did Thornton get it from? Okay, so you know that Thornton got it from the sheriff's sale from, Par from, from Harper, Maud. Okay, and then where did Maud get it from, Josh, uh, John? Maud got it from... As a matter of record, where, wh what's the only record you have? Only the 1928 uh, yes. conveyance from the... You then find the 1928 conveyance. I want to understand that. I'm going one step at a time. Your paradise. You're buying it from Thornton. You ask yourself, where did Thornton get it from? You search. You say, ah, there was a sale. And the sale came from Harper to Thornton. Aha. Where did Harper get it from? You find the 1928 deed to Maud. <coughs> now, the 1928 deed tells you some, tells you some funny stuff, right? The 1928 deed says, well, we have this deed that's missing. We don't know where it is. But three or four heirs agree to give it away. And so John, finish it up. What should that 1928 D do to Paradise when they bought the farm? Should have uh, given them notice that it's someone else had a, a yes. conflicting interest in the property. That's right. That's critical, OK? The 1928 deed was in the chain of title. That was public record. The 1928 deed was in the chain of title. And if you review the 1928 deed, you are on inquiry notice that some other document existed. And maybe if you can't find it, it's not record notice, but it's inquiry notice that you should hesitate before buying Black Acre. So therefore, uh, uh, Ben, was um, a Paradise a bona fide purchaser for value, that notice? Uh, no. He wasn't, right? Paradise was not a BFP. Paradise was not a BFP. Why? Because he had notice. He could have found it through inquiry. He didn't. Therefore, he can't claim the protection. And this sucks for him, because he'd been living there for 20 years. And after all this, Ben, who gets the land? The heirs of Maud Harper get it. Because that was what the original 1922 deed said. Under the original 22 deed, the heirs of Maud get it. Everyone get the, I'll get to average possession in a minute, but everyone get the general gist. Yes, Dakota. Under the general matter, when the report closed the sale, is the bank not acquired title or the deed to the property when it forecloses in, like, in the sense that they, would, they could record the property themselves so that interest would pass from the bank? Well, again, at a foreclosure sale, the bank can only obtain the title that the debtor had. So if the debtor only had a life estate, then the bank only obtains a life estate. So assume that it was uh, fee simple. OK. So then would the bank, they would, would they be able to record a deed from the foreclosure sale if they wanted? Yeah, I mean, the way it works is the sheriff, it's a sheriff deed. The sheriff is conveying it from Maud to the bank by virtue of the foreclosure sale. That, that's what the deed would say. Okay. Uh, uh, Trevor, what about adverse possession? Like, they were on the land for a long time. Why, why didn't Paradise acquire through adverse possession? Uh, the clock didn't start until the last couple of years. Why? Uh, they just didn't get no life estate. Yeah. You can't squat on the remainder until they get it, right? So even if. I don't think you can adversely possess against the owner of a life estate. Maybe able to, but it's not very valuable. Because once that person dies, you lose it. And the clock starts afresh. And then once the heirs came along, the remainder men said, you didn't squat against us. We had no notice. And therefore, there was no adverse possession. Yeah? In a very obvious <coughs> question, why did the heirs, um, why were they not able to divide the property when they were trying to give a are we talking about a 1922? 
What do you mean divide? I, I think I know what you're asking, but just ask it one more time. Like each of them has an equal interest in a property. Uh huh. How come that property couldn't have been equally divided for and three fourths of the property given an FSA each year? So do you remember how joint <coughs> how joint tenancy works? So you studied joint tenancy last semester, right? Let's say you know uh, you and I are joint tenants on Blackacre. Does that mean I own the left part of Blackacre and you own the right part of Blackacre? Is that what joint tenancy means? No. no. What, what does joint tenancy mean? Sorry, Zeke. Yeah. The idea of joint tenancy is not I own half and you own half. It's we each have an undivided claim to the entirety of Blackacre. So it's not that. I own this quarter, you own that quarter, they own everything all together. Now, if all four of them united, they could have all shifted their interest, but John wasn't interested, so he didn't play along. Make sense? Okay, so um, the bottom line is that the 1928 deed provided inquiry notice to the paradises and therefore, they cannot be bona fide purchasers. And they're not bona fide, therefore the heirs prevail. And they get Blackacre back after 100 something years, right? 50 something years is a long time. They get the farm back, not pay over Wanda. Poor Maud, I don't know what her deal was. She, she, everyone loved her, but they didn't trust her, right? I, I think Susan knew what was up. She was like, this woman put a mortgage on it within five minutes for 50 bucks, and then defaulted like a, right away, you know. Maybe she was a spendthrift, who knows? We, we don't know. Okay, questions in that case. All right, let me say a few words on title insurance. There's a little bit of a reading on it. Um, the title insurance uh, is heavily regulated by the state. Indeed, the state has a table uh, that lists the rates of how much title insurance costs. So, for example, uh, like a $50,000 piece of property the policy might be $500. And the $100,000 property, the title insurance policy might be $800, right? So it's gradiated. Uh, but the more expensive the property is, the more uh, the policy costs. Uh, I put some links in the syllabus to the Texas ones. You're welcome to review them. Uh, but generally, these policies are fairly affordable, and they're very important. Uh, today, records are pretty good. You don't have these conflicts often, but they're useful to have. OK. Questions? Okay. So let me give a preview. Uh, tomorrow at 4 in a room to be determined. I don't know which one, but hopefully it's this one. If it's not, we'll figure it out. From 4 to 5.30, um, we will have uh, our, our, our makeup class on uh, nuisance and remedies. I think you did these cases in torts. You usually do. Uh, so it should be familiar. Uh, if you can't come tomorrow, watch the live stream. Watch on demand. You can email me. And then on Thursday, you have me, oh goodness, three days in a row. Uh, we're back here, same time, same place. We'll be starting with the easements topic. Any questions? All right, I'll see you all tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, thank you very much.